so now we are going to discuss about nephrotic syndrome okay so before starting uh, this uh, topic so you have to be very sure that this is not a disease per se okay and this is not a diagnosis so this is a clinical condition so it is actually a set of signs and symptoms signs and symptoms that that occur whenever there is a glomerular injury it may be a glomerulonephritis or it may be glomerulopathy okay there is a slight difference between glomerulopathy and glomerulonephritis okay so glomerulonephritis means there will be an evidence of inflammation but in glomerulopathy it may or may not be inflammation okay though there are uh, there is a minute difference between them both are not synonyms okay uh, just understand that so next is so i have already explained what is how glomerulus how does it uh, what is the structure and all okay just uh, see here so this is the uh, glomerular capillary which are surrounded by what podocytes okay podocyte means the visceral epithelial cell visceral epithelial cell okay and this is the three components of the glomerular uh, filtration barrier that is the endothelia the basement membrane and the podocyte so any damage to this any damage to this causes the loss of proteins loss of proteins i have already explained in uh, different videos that glomerulus is a charge selective barrier it's a size selective barrier okay so there are several mechanisms which prevent the glomerulus from losing the important components from losing protein from losing uh, clotting factors from losing rbcs and all okay uh, so that's why whenever there is a injury to this filtration barrier so then uh, certain things happen and this group of symptoms so they are together called uh, nephrotic syndrome so let's see the components and why uh, they are called so so first is heavy proteinuria i, I already explained in the types of uh, proteinuria that video that glomerular proteinuria is usually heavy it ranges from 1 to 30 gram per day okay so usually you can generally say more than 3 to 3.5 gram per day uh, usually occurs in nephrotic syndrome that means there is a heavy proteinuria okay right so normally i told you and around up to 100 mg in a day is normally uh, what uh, proteinuria it occurs normally and uh, uh, most of it will be reabsorbed by the tubules most of it will be reabsorbed by the tubules but now there is excess of proteinuria mainly the albumin albumin it is a low molecular weight Uh, protein okay why albumin because it is a it is a low molecular weight protein and there are multiple mechanisms by which albumin can be lost okay it is not that only albumin is lost but mainly in nephrotic syndrome albumin is the protein that is lost okay so there is heavy proteinuria that is albuminuria okay so there is albuminuria so the first component is heavy proteinuria so when the protein is lost in the urine so what happens to its level in the blood so there will be hypoalbuminemia so the level of albumin in the blood will be less but just remember uh, daily on uh, an average a person of weight around uh, 60 kg will usually on an average we can if we can consider 1 uh, uh, mg uh, sorry 1 gram per kg if he consumes this is usually the uh, the required uh, uh, amount of protein uh, daily around 1 gram per kg so a 60 kg person usually can consume 60 gram per day and also the liver synthesizes up to some 10 to 15 grams in a day okay liver synthesizes 15 grams uh, we consume around 60 gram in a day still there is hypoalbuminemia still there is hypoalbuminemia what is the reason the reason is that there is not only there is leakage of a uh, uh, proteins but also there is increased catabolism that means increased breakdown okay there is a problem in the reabsorption in the tubules there is a problem in the reabsorption in the tubules also okay so you should remember that though the uh, the protein loss is usually less compared to what we consume the problem is there is increased catabolism that is there is increased breakdown of those proteins okay so that is the problem so the second component is hypoalbuminemia and third component is see these three components are interrelated there is nothing like you have to buy it and one and the other 
first is protein is lost in the urine second protein because of that the level of protein will be less in the blood and because of that there will be edema so these are interrelated okay so how it leads to edema how how loss of albumin leads to edema okay just consider this as a blood vessel okay so these are the cells so these are the cells so this gap is the interstitial space this gap the gap you are seeing is the interstitial space this is the interstitium okay so this is the albumin this is the albumin so i told you the function of albumin is to is to maintain the plasma volume is to maintain the plasma volume that means as long as as long as albumin is there in the intravascular compartment as long as the albumin is there in the blood it exerts an osmotic pressure that's why it is called colloidal osmotic pressure colloidal osmotic pressure okay as long as it is there okay it exerts a kind of osmosis osmosis means it holds together okay colloidal osmotic pressure also called oncotic pressure okay so that's why the the fluid can stay here only the fluid can stay here only that means the intravascular compartment is maintained because of albumin okay not only because of albumin there are other plasma proteins uh, proteins also but main thing is about the albumin but when there is loss of this albumin in the urine uh, so what happens so so there is loss of this albumin in the urine so there is less uh, albumin in the blood now only let's write only one so because of this the intravascular compartment the intravascular compartment the the fluid component actually it goes to the interstitium the fluid component goes to the interstitium okay it goes to the interstitium actually it is not a active process it is not a active process okay i will explain what is active process and passive process it is just like a passive phenomena just only because albumin is not there in the blood the fluid is simply going to the interstitial space there is no nothing like excess of force which is applied uh, because of which the the fluid is forced out of the blood vessel and it is uh, going inside the interstitial component okay it is not like that it is simply uh, because of the fact that the fluid uh, is not maintained in the intravascular compartment because albumin is not there okay so this is the reason for edema i will explain uh, in bit detail see here the edema is seen in the periorbital region it is seen in the ankle region that means it is a peripheral edema peripheral edema where the edema is seen in uh, edema is seen in areas where there is loose connective tissue loose connective tissue okay so this is the difference between other types of edema and renal edema see other types of edema for example cardiac edema and all the edema is due to increased hydrostatic pressure increased hydrostatic pressure okay for example if this is a blood vessel because of the force because of the pressure the fluid is forced forced out so that is called congestion congestion since the blood vessel are congested blood vessel are congested with blood so that creates a pressure through which the the plasma the fluid component is actively forced out okay this is cardiac edema but renal edema is different it is i told you it is a passive process where the fluid the intravascular compartment just leaves it only for the fact that that there is no albumin there is no albumin and that there is no uh, what osmotic pressure that can be exerted so that's why it is usually seen in since the since it is a passive process and the pressure uh, game is not here so it is usually seen in areas where there is loose connective tissue loose connective tissue where where do you see loose connective tissue around the eyes okay that's why there will be puffy face periorbital edema okay you can call it as periorbital edema usually around the eyes where there is a loose connective tissue but gradually the renal edema it progresses to all over the body okay so that is a different topic but renal edema in the initial portion in, in the initial uh, uh, time so it will be a periorbital or in the peripheral areas right 
next hyperlipidemia and lipiduria see uh, there will be loss of proteins and that's why because of that uh, there is uh, low level of proteins in the uh, body so because of this there is feedback stimulation for the liver it starts to synthesize more lipoproteins it starts to synthesize more lipoproteins see proteins are synthesized but along with that the excess uh, the lipid component is also there now so there is more ldl uh, there is more cholesterol so there is total uh, the triglyceride level is also very high the triglyceride levels are also high but the hdl level becomes less hdl is a good cholesterol the level it be levels become less but you should remember uh, the ldl why it actually rises uh, uh, the thing is the ldl receptors become internalized they become internalized okay see this is a blood vessel so imagine these are the cells these are the ldl receptors ldl receptors and if ldl is there if the receptor is outside it comes and sits on it and it can gain entry into the intracellular aspect but now the receptor is not there now the receptor is not there ldl remains in the intravascular compartment itself okay it will not be internalized into any cell it will not be used anywhere it still it's just uh, remains in the intravascular compartment what is the reason the ldl receptors become internalized only when there is a receptor ldl will be absorbed into a cell but now since the receptors are internalized the receptors just go back they go back inside the cell because of a pcsk it is a protease so there is an increase in the level of pcsk what is pcsk it is a protease uh, when the protease levels are very high the receptors will become internalized the receptors just go inside a cell so since uh, the receptors are not there now ldl simply it uh, stays in the intravascular compartment itself okay so this is the reason for hyperlipidemia and also there will be lipiduria because excess of lipid is there in the blood obviously it will be filtered in the kidney and because of the overload so there will be lipiduria okay so that thing you have to remember then hypercoagulability hypercoagulability means the blood becomes blood becomes thick what is the reason because of loss of loss of certain factors for example antithrombin 3 antithrombin 3 a uh, very vari variation of the level of protein c variation level of protein s and the liver starts to synthesize more uh, fibrinogen the liver starts to synthesize more of fibrinogen fibrinogen increased from the liver and fi but fibrin breakdown is less fibrin breakdown is less so fibrinogen synthesis is more but fibrin breakdown is less and antithrombin 3 protein c protein s they are lost almost they are lost in the urine they are lost in the urine so because of that what happens the blood becomes the highly viscous highly viscous and that's why high chances of renal vein thrombosis clotting phenomena okay renal vein thrombosis renal vein thrombosis see here so these are the clots renal vein thrombosis pulmonary embolism so these are very very uh, com important complications of uh, nephrotic syndrome okay see uh, that's why remember nephrotic syndrome is a hypercoagulable state it increases the viscosity of the blood okay so uh, that you should remember and i told you nephrotic syndrome is itself not a diagnosis okay you should remember that there are several causes for it 